in businesses like mine, we talk a lot about and so many industries. We talk a lot about teamwork, but the truth is, it's about individual excellence. Like, there'll be a moment where I have to, I have to stand up. Maybe it's in a pitch or a presentation, and it's all, it's all about my uh, ability to perform and. When, when I've been lucky enough to do a number of vocal performances with uh, uh, my choir, uh, and what I love is it's not, it's never about me, uh, and it's such a good life lesson, and it's a, it's a, it's a relief. It's like you're just lending your 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 sound to contribute to something extraordinary. Hi there, and welcome to This Is Why We Sing a podcast from me, James Sills, that's all about the transformative power of singing. Today's guest knows all about the transformative power of singing. He is Richard Huntington and he's the head of strategy at Saatchi and Saatchi. Now, you might think, why is an advertising executive appearing on a podcast about singing? Well, Richard today is evangelical about how singing can help us find focus and the flow state in everyday life. And Richard's so evangelical about singing that he's even invited me to run singing workshops for his team at Saatchi and Saatchi. Now, it hasn't always been this way. Richard, like many, many people I come across, spent most of his adult life thinking that he was a non-singer, that singing just simply wasn't for him. We met back in 2018 at the Do Lectures in West Wales. I was there giving a talk about the power of singing And later that weekend, I ran a singing workshop that Richard, at the last minute, decided to come to. And over the hour, I saw a real transformation in Richard, going from the journey from considering himself to be a non-singer, to finding his voice, to singing confidently. After the weekend, Richard went home, he found a local choir that he joined with his wife, and it's had a profound impact on his personal life, all of which we discuss in today's conversation. As always, I hope this provides some insight and some inspiration, particularly for those people who might have stopped singing or consider themselves, like Richard did, to be a non-singer. We recorded this conversation in early 2021 when we were both still in lockdown, myself in North Wales and Richard in London. Well, welcome to the podcast, Richard. Thank you so much for taking some time out today to join me. No worries, James. First thing I'm going to ask you is, what song's in your head right now? Well, it's uh, it's going round and round and round in my head. It is, uh, now I'm not sure what the song is called, it's from the Les Miserables medley, and it's the it's about, do you hear uh, the people sing, uh, sing oh, the yeah. songs of angry men? You know, it's, uh, it's got that sort <laughs> of uh, um, uh, kind of military rhythm to it, uh, and I'm practising it at the moment. Um, or not practicing it enough uh, as I ought to be at the moment, but that's what's swimming around in my head. And as so often, I think with with the songs that you learn as part of a choir, uh, it's it's not necessarily music you you it, at first sight you love or you think you love. And and I, what I love in part is that you you develop an affection for music that you think is corny or cliched or. Mm. Uh, and and I think I probably would have gone, oh, Les Miserables, honestly. Uh, but but I'm well into it now. <laughs> I'm well into Les Mis. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's a distinction, isn't there, between listening to music and kind of consuming it in that way and actually performing it. Have you found that? Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, so I, I, I'd say things like uh, I, I, I groaned at the thought of performing Westlife. Westlife? I, w- I wouldn't do that at all. Uh, but, well, I did a bit of that. We did. Uh, what's that? That's, that's off limits. <laughs> but, or it was actually um, West Side Story, uh, and and yet, you know, you spend time. If you spend time with that music, it it the thing often those those songs and the and the music that seem to be the backdrop to our life and therefore not worth paying attention to come alive again. A really good example. I hate old Anxine. I mean, I just I think hate the cliche mm. of New Year's Eve and. And uh, and actually, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful song, and and I, and I think one of the great privileges of starting to sing, and I suppose what I'm doing is making a distinction between sort of singing at the level of karaoke, which is just singing a song, I suppose, mm. and singing where you 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 
to whatever extent learn a piece of music or learn a song uh, and um, and therefore have a, a, a more intimate knowledge and understanding of it. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, and then you kind of become the song because you're giving your voice to it. You know, it's internalised and you have a different relationship with that song. Yeah, and I had a really interesting conversation with um, David Anobu from Choir, 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 who leads singing like me and with them, you know, talking about their song choice and not necessarily picking songs to work with groups that are their favourite song in the world, but choosing songs that are going to bring the best out of people and create these kind of magical moments. So, yeah, that that is an interesting one. Um about song choices. Now, Richard, one of the great pleasures of, of what I do um, as a singing leader is seeing people go on their kind of singing journeys and seeing people, you know, um, perhaps growing confidence or discover something new. And um, the reason I've asked you to the podcast today is because I, I think of all the people I've seen who've gone on these singing journeys, yours has been one of the most just remarkable and, and perhaps because you've been very eloquent at you know writing about it on your blog and you know we've kept in touch and um so that there's so much I'd, I'd like to to talk to you about really because you are definitely a convert um which is excellent and this is partly I guess the remit of the podcast is to try and cast out and, and convert more people so it was 2018 that that we first met and, and we'll definitely talk about that at the do lectures um which is where we where we first sang together. But um, could you maybe describe your relationship with singing um, before that, you know, growing up in your childhood? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, non-existent. And, and I think, you know, you talked about conversion. I, I wasn't an agnostic. I think I was an atheist about singing. And, and right. I'd uh, absented myself. And, and I, I can't... So many people can put it down to a conversation where somebody said, you shouldn't sing or you can't sing. I can't mm. put it down to a moment, but, but throughout my life I've carried the idea that A, I'm not musical uh, at all, uh, and B, that I cannot sing. And, and the, the objective evidence I would have used would be ha- ha- the impossibility of, you know, even if I was just hu- humming along in a car, I couldn't make the sound that came out of my mouth sound the same as what my ears were hearing it seemed to me to be impossible to replicate and I think there are lots of there are lots of reasons f- for that I mean if you try and sing uh, you, you know wham rap and you're not George Michael uh, you're going to have difficulty singing it uh, in the way it's going into your ears but but so a lot of it I think has got to do with the, the your your natural pitch and where you pitch yourself and all that sort of stuff but I genuinely would say I'd absented myself, edited myself out of any contact with, with, with singing whatsoever. And, and that sense of you said, you know, I felt that I wasn't musical as well. You know, they, these are things that a lot of people do carry with them. And I think they're possibly two, two separate things. Um, have you any idea where that might have come from? You know, just not thinking that you were musical, not thinking you yeah. know, that it was for you? Uh, well, I think, you know, years and years and years being forced to... to, to play in the piano and have piano lessons and, and never really get any further than grade one and uh yeah. and and escaping from that expectation as soon as was possible i think there's a lot you know i didn't like the music that i mean we were talking about that earlier on but i didn't like the, you know classically i didn't like the music mm-hmm. that you're forced to learn to play as a kid when you're forced to learn the piano but, but i think I think it, it's not a it's not a dislike of music. I mean, I adore music, I, and, and music's been a really important part of my life. Not in a sophisticated or highbrow way, just in a you know, I love music as yeah. we all do. But but the the, the that separation between um, enjoying music and contributing to music it seemed absolute to me. Right, and kind of a bridge that couldn't couldn't, couldn't be crossed. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's 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 talk about um, the do lectures then in two thousand eighteen. Um, do you want to maybe give a a bit of a background to the event? You know, why you decided to go, what you were hoping to get out of out of the weekend? Yeah, I mean, without going to to too much detail, I had a pretty grim twenty eighteen, um, and and then very selfishly, I, I decided to go to the do lectures. Uh, because it's not inexpensive and, and it is sort of like de- depriving your family of a holiday so you can selfishly wander off to West Wales and hang out with some amazing people and it'd be really, really irritating when you come back. 
you know, <laughs> Tell I mean, some amazing yeah. people, you know, uh, yeah. I tried not to do that. Um, uh, so it was, a, it, it was, it was genuinely, it sounds really odd, but it was genuinely something I just did for me. Um, mm-hmm. and I had no expectation really, uh, just a desperate need to, to find some outside stimulus, uh, to top up my world. Uh, whether that was intellectually or practically, I just was looking for something, and uh, and of course it delivers that in in spades. And and there are a lot of things that I did as a result of of the do lectures. I mean, the, singing is the most enduring. You might might come on to that. Um, so so I, I was really open minded and open hearted, and 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 I think that that's important because the moment I met you. Was was not a I I I wonder whether it would be good fun to learn to sing. I wonder whether a singing workshop would be just the right thing. I was at a really low ebb, and uh, and uh, it was it was between a ceramics workshop and a singing workshop because I, I'd done a really intellectual workshop the day before, and I had right. not not enjoyed it at all. And I, and I think I, I need something. I just need something different. And so honestly, I walked into it almost in a sort of belligerent sense of I can't sing I've never been able to sing I'm not musical but I'm on the do lectures it's Saturday you're in a pretty weird space by Saturday yeah like uh, yeah you kind of you've met everybody you you know you kind of totally and they've been it's been a bit profound the the morning of Saturday it just happened to be there were two men speaking first early on who were very beautiful and spoke as men in in a, in a in a way that restored a bit of my faith in my own masculinity, so I was in this lovely space and very open minded and open hearted. But I've got to say, it's not. I didn't. It wasn't like oh goody, James is doing a workshop. I shall certainly sign up for that. It, it was a, <laughs> almost a spur of the moment. Yeah. Kind of what have I got to lose? And and at that point, um, I'd already given my talk. I'll put it in the show notes. Actually, since we're talking about it, but. Um... Yeah, I was invited to to speak for 20 minutes, as all um, speakers do at the do lectures. And uh, yeah, so I spoke about the power of singing, the power of singing together and focusing on, you know, aspects of it, such as, you know, community and and connection and less on it actually being about a performance art and something that you judged uh, against. Uh, You know, and I had a captive audience, which, which is great because I quite like parachuting into these situations where people aren't quite expecting to be made to sing and in the last five minutes of of the talk I actually just did a mini workshop in, in this you know old um old barn converted barn with 100 150 people uh you know and then I went off you know about the rest of the weekend and and then so the workshop was kind of a follow-up to that so I guess you maybe had a taster um of of kind of what my what my vibe is as a singing leader but that's still a brave move um you know for someone who carries you know those or who carried those preconceptions about not being a singer not being musical and that you were you know perhaps a little bit frightened or whatever and then do you want to because i I just like over the course of the hour of that workshop i saw such a transformation uh richard in just in how you were holding yourself and how you were singing i think you almost didn't you almost leave in the middle of it because you thought you were singing the wrong voice part i remember we had a little yeah we did we did i think i I think it's kind of worth touching upon because, you know, we'd, we'd gathered in this silage pit and in, in a circle and you'd organise this. I've been, I, I'm trying to remember properly, but you'd organise this according to so, sort of roughly according to voice. Uh, and, I, and I'd assume, I'm not sure you called it tenors and basses and altos. I think and we had artists, like... But you'd certainly... Th- yeah, I think it was like tops, up. middles and yeah, lows yeah, yeah. or something, wasn't it? Yeah. And because I have a self-perception... Of, that I am not a blokey bloke, which I think is true. But 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 I'd made this c- conclusion: I can't be a bass then. I must be. I must be in a middle a middle part. What, mm. what we call a tenor now, I guess. Uh, and we were we started off, I think, and uh, you you moved me quite quickly because I couldn't sing. I mean, I think hopefully my range has developed a bit since then, but I couldn't sing at that at that pitch and. And that would be a, maybe a simple moment for you. Like, and, and for me, it felt a little bit, bit like being told off or like I'd done something wrong. But, but in a sense, it was this completely profound realisation that, that A, when you're singing at the 
pitch or uh, the part that that's that right feels for your good voice, for you. that, yeah. that it's a totally different experience. And that's one of the things I, th- I think I often try to explain to people is, um, it is you're probably, you're being, fo- maybe your voice is being forced to sing a song because you're singing along to the radio. That isn't necessarily right. your voice. And that's my, that's exactly. my, my point. So it was, it was more profound than perhaps you might have thought at the time being moved and also a huge reflection. I mean, I've got many feelings about that moment to do with, with gender and mm, twat yeah. choir, choir. Please, please expand. Yeah. I mean, you know, something that I'm super interested in is particularly, yes, singing, men singing, its relationship to concepts of masculinity. Like I could talk about that all day, Richard, so feel free. Well, I mean, I just, that, it was a moment of going, I'm a bass. Fucking, I'm a bass. You know, that's, mm. uh, that's like, for me, that was a k- kind of interesting, it, it felt more natural. We, we were singing a very beautiful song. I think it was a, a it's an original composition by somebody from Spooky Men's Chorus or... We was, yeah, we were singing The Sweetest Kick in the Heart by... Yeah. Written by Stephen Taberner, who is the uh, the leader um, mastermind of the Spooky Men's Choral with whom I sing. That's and if, right. I, I think, Richard, I think there's a video of the performance somewhere that someone recorded on the phone. So I might, I might, I will include it in the show notes because it's nice to give a bit of context, but it's a very beautiful, very simple, very kind of slow moving arrangement, isn't it? I mean, it really tugs on the heart. It really tugs on the heartstring and, 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 and um, these, these lovely parts to sing. What it made me feel, and I, I feel this profoundly, because I've sung in, in with just men and and, uh, and men and women subsequently, it's a it's a environment, a choir's environment where where men are needed, or the male voice, or the sorts of voices men are more able to create uh, are needed, and uh, and and in a sense, it's a, an escape. I don't want to you know make special pleading. I'm you know somebody who has enjoyed enormous privilege because of my gender and my ethnicity and my upbringing and class but mm-hmm. but but i had this morning where i heard two amazing men uh very open and generous talk about themselves and uh it was like this it was like um a restoration of or, or a recognition of what's good about masculinity as opposed to what's mm-hmm. destructive and yeah. and it was just lovely to be in a choir where 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 your voice is distinct and your voice matters i would hold on i just need to or i would also simultaneously say that uh that you don't matter at all i I think that's one of the profound things about about my experience of choirs is you contribute you contribute but you don't contributing to the greater whole the greater whole but you're not you're not it's the spotlight's not on you specifically you're not the whole yeah so that was really emotionally a moving emotionally moving for me and then um and then I think, honestly, James, and, and I think this is what you're so brilliant at and why, why I have such faith in your ability to, to, to work very quickly with new groups, is I think we all got to the end of that hour, hour and a half, and went, I can't believe that we've created something that sounds objectively beautiful to my ear. And though I may not have been amazing myself, the collective uh, out- outcome uh, w- was actual music. It wasn't, it wasn't a, just a singing workshop in which... I, I don't know, we'd all got a little bit better. We produced something that sounded to me like actual music. Yeah. And that, that, that if, if you've go, gone, if you've edited yourself out of ever being capable, whether through an instrument or your own voice, to create music, then to actually do that and to do that after a bizarrely short period of time seemed astonishing mm. to me. Yeah, and that's, that is a real joy. That is such a joy for me to um, help kind of, pull the pull the strings you know and um we were we were you know the, we were in a lovely setting we mentioned it was a silage pit i feel we should probably expand on that it, it i think it had been used as a silage pit at some point but it it was this kind of concrete kind of um i wasn't gonna say dungeon but it, you know it is it, it was it was like an empty swimming pool yeah yeah it, that's right it was, it was like an empty swimming pool but it had the most wonderful acoustics didn't it <laughs> um which is which you know really helps um but it was it was a it was a beautiful beautiful moment and what was really interesting was that it was meant to be just like a self contained workshop because you know my big thing it's not actually about the performance it's about the process right yeah but then we got to the end and 
and almost everybody was like, can't we perform that? We need to sing that. We need to show that to everybody. But don't you find that extraordinary? Because, I, I mean, maybe some of those people who've signed up to your workshop because they know you and they love you and they've worked with you before, been to the Julie, whatever. But, but I, there must have been a high proportion of people who go, I'm doing a workshop. If you think well, I'm going to perform anything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? And then, and then it's, it's almost not just, it's not just what, what was created. It was the willingness, the eagerness of the collective yeah. to, to, yeah. Um, to share it. To share it. And I think, I think it's important the way that you frame these things because, yeah, if I'd said to everybody, we're going to do a singing workshop and then we're going to perform it to everybody. To the entire new lectures. Or, or, <laughs> or we're going to make a recording of it forever. People will be like, no, no, mate, come on. <laughs> you know, I'm off to do some ceramics. Um, but yeah, there was, a, there was something that was very organic about that. And uh, that was very lovely because people were just very keen to share it. But then I think I gave a bit of a pep talk saying, look, performing something, it, this is, you know, it kind of feels different. You know, we've been doing this entirely for ourselves. Suddenly, or, you know, a few hours later, we're going to have another 100 people who are just going to be listening to the end result. They haven't seen everything else that we've done in between. You know, so I remember saying, like, do you really want to do this? Like, we can just keep it as this little precious thing that we've done. But pretty much everyone was like, let's just do it. That's great. And so a few hours later, we still sang in the circle. And my wife and my my daughter, who was, I think, was about 18 months at the time, yeah. they were singing as well. So it was really special for me. Uh, but then everyone else from the whole um, weekend from the Do Lectures were there surrounding all of the singers. So it was, it was a really powerful moment. And then in a moment of madness, perhaps, I asked David and Claire, who, you know, who set the, the Do Lectures up and are very much at the heart of it, they, I asked them to stand in the middle. So, so they were surrounded by the singers... And then all the singers were surrounded by everybody who'd attended the weekend. And, you know, it was it was a deeply emotional moment. And I still apologise to David and Claire for kind of, you know, putting them in that position. And they always say, no, it was really, it was wonderful, you know, and and, and, and we've spoken about that. But it, yeah, there was, just, there was just a real intensity. And I think, I don't know, there's so much we could pull out of that. I think there was so much about that that was just in the moment. And I, I think this is something perhaps you know we can go on to talk about is just really being in the moment I know and that's something that it's banded around so much and it's so easy to say but so bloody hard to do is just sitting in in that in sitting in the moment and just letting that be your reality and being open to that and I think that is perhaps why the workshop was so powerful and then that final performance I don't know if there's anything you want to reflect on there uh, no, I, I, I think, I think when you spend all of your life either in the future, or in the past, and so many of us do, and 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 I, and I certainly do professionally, as well as personally, the ability to, to be so focused, and I, and actually, I, I, I've, I found that's in part because it's not, because I'm working, I'm trying to, it sounds awful, and when I say I'm trying to be good at it, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to be an amazing singer I'm, I'm but I am working at something that is valuable to me sure it's, va- it's valuable to me to so so in a workshop like that I'm not pissing around I'm not you know, do, doing it for for, for for life I was I was I was trying to learn and, and be good and I, and I think pa- perhaps mm. that focus of, of you know you're not, not you're not letting something drift past you, you you're kind of latching onto it and trying hard uh, um, that really helps stop the distraction, uh, mm. and, and I found that subsequently that that um, the singing in a choir requires focus, mm. and therefore, uh, in that moment, I am not able, I'm not capable of wondering, you know, about the, my to do list or what's happening after this or what I'm going to have for tea or you know. Yeah, um, I mean, and how valuable is that? I mean, it's completely, increasingly. Completely. Um, so yeah, I mean, w- would you say that that you know you can achieve the flow state when you're singing, or have you achieved that? Do you think? Because you know, when um, Mihai Chick sent Mihai wrote about the flow state, there's very kind of specific circumstances, and one of the things is that you're doing a task that um, that is achievable, but is just at the kind of the limits of your capabilities. You know, so it's not something that's you know too easy, and it's not something that's too impossibly difficult. Yes, and and that is, that that's 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 at best how it feels. Yeah, that's I mean that's what I, that's what I'm always aiming for as a practitioner. 
you know, there'd be no point me doing something for an hour that that people had learned in five minutes and you didn't go anywhere with it. But at the same time, you know, I'm not going to try and do a, I don't know, a 15 minute version of Bohemian Rhapsody in an hour that, that you know, that we're not going to be able to do. Um, I, I, and that, that, that is part, part of, I think, the appeal of of your, your particular approach to workshops, I'm sure workshops more generally, but, but, but when we did, we, and we'll possibly get onto this, but when, when I introduced you to the advertising agency I work for, um, I knew what, what I wanted to help them have is a sense of achievement, like to, mm. that you come away with something. It's not just you spent some time singing, but you go, my God, I can't believe we actually did that. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. That, and it isn't, it isn't for most people, it isn't easy. Presumably there are performers who rock up on stage and it just comes out. Uh, but I think possibly, certainly my experience, <laughs> sure, for many people is, is this is, it's, it's something you, you want to work at. And I wonder whether, you know, they say of chess, anybody can play it, but it take, it's really difficult to be very good. Like I, I kind of quite like that about singing in that I think yeah. I think I now realise that and there was a moment genuinely I like that analogy. where where I said I, I I kind of went from I'm trying to learn to sing to I can sing, but then the 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 bandwidth of from when I can sing to I I can sing really well is so enormous and infinite and wonderful that and that that's why I think it perhaps it creates a space for flow because. Because you're just at always at the at best, you're at the edge always of what you're capable mm. of. Brilliant, yeah. That's that's a brilliant. It's a brilliant analogy. And I'm not, I'm not. My my mission isn't to turn people into world beating chess players. Like there are people, you know, there are singing teachers, and mm. for whom that is their mission. They want to work and and you know work with people at the highest level in terms of technicality and that kind of thing. But that's like that isn't where the joy is for me. Like the joy. For me, it is is taking people on that journey and getting them into the space where, they're like, yes, I'm a singer, yes, I'm a chess player, and then deciding for themselves like how far they want to take that. and And it's been really interesting seeing seeing the steps that you've taken, Richard. I mean, let's just talk about you just talk about about the session we did um, the other week. Uh, do you want to maybe explain how that came about? And you know, you've kind of alluded to your 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 role, your work. Um, in advertising and and again this is a really interesting space for me to come into as a practitioner um, doing a workshop for, 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 for yourself and for your colleagues so do you want to maybe talk about you know maybe perhaps the, the rationale for that because it might not seem the most obvious thing to do with the remote team yeah, is I mean, to uh, yeah, okay. parachute me in with my guitar <laughs> <laughs> worked very well I, I should say you know part of this journey has been I, I, I didn't just do that workshop and, and go that was nice uh, and then I'll maybe I'll rock up and to James's book signing at some point. Uh, like it was, it was a moment where I go, I'm going to do this. So mm. I found a, a community choir close to me and started. Uh, um, and it's a it's a different experience, and it's it's singing uh, from from music, uh, not just by ear. And um, and I've, I've really enjoyed that. But but so, so there's there's a journey that takes place for me in terms of. What I then pursued, how that I evangelised about this. I mean, I've got my wife joined the choir. My mum, um, who was told by her mother uh, that she couldn't sing when she was sixteen, joined the choir. And my uh, wife's mum joined our choir. Like it's it's been this sort of massive explosion or ripple from 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 that initial experience with you. So I, I have that happening in, in in my life, but simultaneously there's. I just knew I really wanted to bring you into um, in, in, into Saatchi and Saatchi in some way, shape or form. Initially, I wanted to do it as a sort of uh, as, as part of a sort of department away day. And I was trying to figure out how, how to make it work and, and also how to, to overcome the idea that if I told anybody that we were going to do a singing workshop, like I, they'd be running, be like, mm. no, no, I, yeah, I need yeah, to get exactly, home. Exactly, exactly. And wash my hair that night, and uh, and and, mm-hmm. and then there's this serendipitous moment I think caused by the second lockdown, and I think I, I don't know how, how how you were feeling, but 
you know, I, I think these last few months have been pretty grim. Uh, it's been a difficult period of, of year. We, anyway, we, we don't know what's happening, when we're going to be out of this. Holding teams together after a year, a year of not physically seeing, encountering people, has become, I think, hugely problematic for, for holding cultures and organisations together. And uh, and and you you sent me an email I think out of the blue and and it was that moment of going yes this is the perfect moment uh, and what I want to do I know what I want to do we have now a, we have an agency meeting every two weeks it's much more frequent than when we were in real life it's need we need it to be that frequent in order to pull everybody together I'm going to do that and then I'm going to try <laughs> try and encourage people to stay on and we're going to yeah. do. We're going to do a, a, a Zoom workshop. You'd, you'd been doing Sofa Singers for such a long time by then. I knew, I knew that format worked. Um, and, I, and, and, and of course, I also knew that the minute that you, essentially, James, the minute you open your mouth, everybody just relaxes into it. It's a, you have an extraordinary uh, presence, even in this remote environment, which is, I think, part of the, of, of the secret of, of, of this Sixer. I'm sure there are lots of vocal leaders d- doing that, but but it was it, it. I knew it would work. I was shitting myself that it wouldn't. Uh, and people would say, Richard, why have you done this? You like you, this is the last well, thing the, we need. The thing is, Richard, as well, is that you, you know you're kind of you're putting yourself on the line a little bit. I mean, I don't mean kind of professionally, but you're bringing something that is so intensely personal and important to you. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, and and is now also important to your wife and your family, yeah. and you're bringing it into your professional sphere. You know, and and there are a lot of people who would not, you know, particularly want those two worlds either to mix or or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I think that was a pretty brave move by yourself. Well, but but, but James, also look at us now. Like like you, you know, you're you're at home, I'm at home. We've seen into everybody we work with, clients and and and. Uh, and and people our own people we've seen into their bedrooms their spare rooms they're under the sure. stairs we've seen seen their kids we, we've seen their lives the lives of the people that we work with in, in, in such a viscerally personal way actually i, I yeah, think actually in, that's intimate. what made it okay yeah. because because right, it, interesting it's, it's, it's pretty transparent weirdly with this screen in in, in, in between us all you, you stuff that we had kept at arm's length you know, that kind of don't bother me at work kind of thing mm. uh just doesn't happen any longer so I, I just wonder whether vulnerability i mean i'm a big fan of vulnerability um in any case but vulnerability is working really well for for, mm. for some people i'm sure i'm sure you have to be in a in a in completely safe space yeah but um yeah for me it seemed like a something worth trying and, and to be honest from the moment that that that's that workshop started it, it i knew it was i mean i, I thought i could oh, if four people turn up it's just gonna be really embarrassing like, and also is it, <laughs> you'd had your meeting yeah yeah you know he was running over a bit as meetings do it was like 5 of 30 in the evening i was like people are just gonna you know well and also honestly they Zoom were gonna and... be going back they, they they were gonna be going back to work and and all i was doing was delaying them going back to work and therefore delaying mm. their evenings i felt super sort of aware of that um but uh when i saw that's a value when i saw people with their kids with their babies mm. with their partners yep. Um, uh, yeah, or housemates to- totally yeah. um, that's what gets me you, you kind of go okay and, and then I kind of go okay well we did something good then like for a moment we did something good and, and it's not going to solve uh, you know all of our issues but, but it, it, was a, it was a it was a good thing to do it was a right thing to do it's a great thing to do and we sang Sal- Salmon and people loved that <laughs> yeah exactly you were out of your chair rocking yeah. rocking bowie it was yeah. yeah it was really it was really fun and and that has been the joy for me and that will continue to be the joy is seeing people like you say with their families at home with their pets with their housemates with their families just in a kind of just in a natural kind of setting you know and that's that's always been part of my mission is to kind of bring singing into that every day and there's nothing much more every day than people literally being at home on their sofas, you know, 
you know, in an everyday kind of work situation. And um, but but like you say, I think for all those reasons that you mentioned about the fact this has been a very difficult, well, a very difficult year, but a very difficult lockdown. I think there's a sense that perhaps people are just a bit more open to these things. Like, come on, if this thing, maybe let's give it a go. You know, if it's going to bring us a bit of joy and connection, let's give it a go. You know, I think there's a sense that, you know, people were really open to that. And so, yeah, so it, it worked. So we, we finally did it after being trying to, to do it for years. We, we finally did it, Richard, which is which Yeah, is well, super, thank you. Super good. And hopefully we will, we will continue. And also I've been, you know, um, evangelising about that experience you know, many of our client organisations, you know, they're they're running insurance companies and and telecoms companies, and you, you know, entirely remotely, they haven't seen each other for months. Mm. You, you know, it's I think it's not a it's not a bunch of ad people having. I think it it's a it's a it's a powerful tool uh, um, to to bring to bring teams together. I, I don't I don't want to oversell it, but but I I, I that experience has added to my conviction uh, of the of the power of of these experiences sure yeah and 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 you know it's been fascinating as well for me uh, and and for you as well I'm sure to 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 note that that does work in a virtual setting as well you know because I mean there was a big um research project from uh, Oxford University which you know kind of concluded that that singing was the ultimate kind of icebreaker in terms of activities for um for adults you know they they it was i don't know they looked at things like um you know okay. night classes and art classes and sports teams and, and measured people's sense of connection to other people and the one that connected people the quickest um unanimously was w- w- singing and, and so that's something that i you know i've, I've spoken a lot about i probably talked about that i'll do lectures it's in my book i think it's really really important and so it's been very interesting to to observe that in in the digital sphere. And you know, I wonder if there will be research coming out about that um, at some point in the future. In fact, about a year before a year before um, lockdown, there was some research around virtual choir videos. Um, Eric Whitaker, the LA uh, you know bass composer, um, who kind of founded the format about ten years ago, not out of necessity, which is why people have been making them in, in mm. lockdown, but you know, just out of another another way of bringing voices together. There was some research on people who participated in the virtual choir videos and that, again, you know, confirmed that they felt more connected, that they felt part of something positive. And so that's, yeah, that's a really interesting space for me. But but I'm glad, you know, kind of almost from the other side that it's working for you both as as, as a singer, but as someone, you know, who, who has a big team and, and you have responsibility for that. So that's that's really interesting. Um... Are there any kind of, I don't know, um, any parallels or any way that that your singing has kind of impacted in your in your professional work apart from doing workshops? You know, maybe in terms of kind of creativity or I mean, they may well be completely separate. And you, you've spoken about how it, it certainly impacted on your personal life, but I wonder, as someone who's completely outside of the advertising <laughs> um, world, um, you know, if 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 there's any kind of impact you might have noticed there. Yeah, I, I think I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that I'm a better strategist or, um, you know, I, the product that we make is better because of this. W- w- where I think this sits for me is, is it in its, um, its contribution to what we might broadly call that Cal Newport idea of deep work. Brilliant. Let's talk about this. Because I, it's not that it, it, it's, it is deep work. I mean, it is deep work. But I think one of the things that we all wrestle with, and it's got worse, it should have been better. We're working from home. It, it, it's got worse in lockdown. Uh, the distraction and the inability for, for many of us to, to find that space to do deep work, uh, by which we mean to be able to focus on an activity um, wholeheartedly and single-mindedly so that you deliver a better outcome. And mm. I think uh, any tools that you have that enable you to, to do that, to practice focus for one thing, uh, whether it's, 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 it's removing stimulus, whether it's, you, you know, uh, moving your social media apps further back in your phone, uh, wh- whether it's uh, it's not sc- you know screens before you go to bed. I mean, all of those things I think mm. are about how we how we 
provide some counterbalance to the distractive distractive forces of our time mm, but, but, age but, of distraction but, yeah but fo- but but practice and fo- at focusing and getting i mean they, they they talk about it takes 20 minutes so th- one of the problems with back to back half hour meetings is it takes about 20 minutes to get into the mindset the cognitive mm. sort of functioning whatever it is about yeah. and then there's this disruption that comes from going doing something else, which is made even worse if you're trying to do things simultaneously. And frankly, this environment means I can, technically, I can do emails while I'm doing this podcast because it's the same exactly. machine. And one of the yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah? So, so, so I, I suppose I'm not making it t- too much of a claim. I simply think that, that singing has helped me practice focus uh, because mm. particularly in a choir, a live choir... Uh, where I can't do anything else and I can't fiddle with my phone and I, you know, and I have to work quite hard. Um, I, I, I basically, that's a hour, hour and a half in my case on a Monday night where I, I practice focusing. I think that's, yeah. and it's then what that, that has the impact that has in the rest of my life. So I'm going to say for me, it's much more about, it's not about direct creativity. It's it's about um, the ability to find focus when you need it. Yeah. And and there's also that thing that once you kind of experience that, and it doesn't have to be through singing, it could be through mm-hmm. meditation mm-hmm. Or, or, or whatever. But once you kind of recognise, ah, this is what it feels like, you know, to do deep work. This is what it feels like to be fully present. Then you can then you've got that as a touchstone, you know, but if you haven't got that as a reference point or if you've kind of forgotten, you know, and I think it's become harder and harder, you know, to do that. I liken it to that idea of muscle memory. Like, yeah, like, exactly. Um, you give yourself a memory of what it's like to be in that, that, that environment and then also some tools and techniques for getting there. Um, so, and I, I, I would, I, you cannot underestimate Maybe it's the wrong way around. I never get that right. But yeah, um, the the <laughs> the value of of finding focus. I mean, yes, and flow is a, a kind of result of that. But the ability, simply in this world of distraction and the immediacy of our lives right now, of being able to 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 zone out or zone in rather to a mm. particular activity, um, and and that's one of the things I really value about it and honestly james that's one of the things i do struggle with 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 uh, online choir choir online singing is is the distractions are still there i like being in a right. chair in front of a yep. vocal leader paying attention mm-hmm. to the sopranos because yeah. because exactly I, yeah, yeah 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 because oh I yeah i mean I it's, it's, a, ver- do it's a very different thing online yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah you can you put your phone in your bag or whatever and you're yes. in the room. And, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think you know, online is just a very different way of working. Like, I, I really, personally, I just really up the pace. You know, there's very little time where it's like, you know, you just sit and listen and I'm going to work on this. It's just like, bam, bam, bam. You know, um, in an earlier podcast for the series, I spoke to Mark Delissa about it. Um, and he was like 45 minutes, <laughs> you know, maximum. You know, he's like, we warm up, we stretch, we sing the song, add a couple of harmonies, sing it through a couple of times, boom, we're done, you know. And I think uh, I think that's probably one way one way around it online, but I completely hear what what, what you're saying. But it's really fascinating to hear about that. And um, it's Cal Newport, did you say? Who? Yeah, um, he he wrote. Well, he I think he f- came up with the phrase "deep deep work." Um, yeah. Uh, and there's a there's a somebody he quote. I like the idea of taking quotes and then sort of using them so much people think that I I come up with them. Uh, but there's a <laughs> yeah, quote. Yeah, great. In, Sh- share one. <laughs> there's a lovely quote. I think he's. I'm not. I, I'm not paid uh, uh, to get on top of things. I'm paid to get to the bottom of things. And and I think if you're in t- if you're professionally, if you're in any um, role where you need to get to the bottom of something, simply rather than stay on top of everything, then then finding ways to focus and uh, and get get into that deep work state. Uh, it's super powerful. I love that. I'll I'll, uh, I'll put that on my bumper <laughs> sticker. That's that's a great one. Thank you. Uh, now, Richard, we have a playlist for the podcast. Every guest gets to choose one song that's going to go on the playlist. It can be okay. any song or vocal performance. Um, what's yours going to be? Okay, it's going to be uh, um, Christopher Plummer singing Edelweiss 
in the sound of music, the original sound of music. Um, obviously, uh, he he passed away very recently. That's right. But, yeah. But um, the 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 reason for that is um, at the end of twenty eighteen. This uh, um, amazing uh, year for me, uh, good and bad. Um, we went away to Scotland for Christmas and New Year, and we had this sort of really, you, you know, like every for New Year, it's like everybody's got to bring a thing, a reading, or it was a, it's a little bit pretentious and precocious. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I decided I what I really wanted to do was to sing a solo for my family, uh, and uh, and I chose Edelweiss, which again I think is another song that when you sing it, when you properly listen to it, when you sing it, it's such a, Seems so beautiful to me, um, uh, so I'm going to choose choose that. Brilliant! I'll add it to the list. Thank you. And just to wrap up today, Richard, um, if you could share a life lesson that singing has taught you, we've already had about fifty three, but um, are we able to nail it down to one? Yeah, it, I think else? so. If you yeah. if you sort of sit it all through, it it's going to be um, it's not all about me, um, and and I, and I and I want to make. Singing, I just described, you know, singing a solo, but actually singing for me is, is a collective experience. It's one in which I lend my voice or my sound to a community. And actually often in part, when you're singing in your part, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's the collective that really makes sense. And uh, although in businesses like mine, we talk a lot about and so many industries, we talk a lot about teamwork. But the truth is, it's about individual excellence. Like there'd be a moment where I have to I have to stand up. Maybe it's in a pitch or a presentation. And it's all it's all about my uh, ability to perform. And when, when I've been lucky enough to do a number of vocal performances with uh, uh, my choir, uh, and uh, and what I love is it's not it's never about me, uh, and it's such a good life lesson. And it's a it's a it's a relief. It's like mm-hmm. for, yeah, for us, it doesn't exactly. have to be. It just doesn't have to yeah. be. You're just lending yeah. your 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 sound to contribute to something extraordinary. And of course, there's that weird thing in choirs which you never. The great tyranny of a choir, I think, is you never hear. You can't hear what it sounds like. Until you hear that recording, or this way, so so mm. eager after a performance. To I do though. I mean, I I always you say do. to my choirs, I've got the best place in the whole choir because I'm at the front. I can hear it all beautifully balanced. I can <laughs> see all. Yeah. Ah. Uh, well, look. Thanks so much, Richard. It's oh, James. you know, it's been such a joy seeing your journey over the last few years. It's been a joy, you know, working with you at Sarches, and I'm just yeah excited to see uh, see what happens next. Well, it's, it's an ongoing journey, as we say. It's a huge, exactly. huge, a huge sort of place to explore. So, thank you, James. Really enjoyed. Yeah, we'll keep, okay. keep exploring. Thanks, Richard. Bye bye. What a wonderful closing reflection there from Richard. That when we sing with other people, it's not about me as an individual. It's about us as a collective. About adding our voice to something bigger than ourselves, and that is really, really powerful. Now, if you go to the show notes, you'll find a link to my talk at the Do Lectures from 2018. You'll also find a recording of our performance of The Sweetest Kick in the Heart featuring Richard that we recorded at the end of the weekend. It was a profoundly moving experience. Richard can be found at his blog, adliterate.com, and I've put a link to a wonderful article called Singing Eat Strategy for Breakfast, which is not just a great title, but it's a great read as well. There's also a link to my website where you can find out more about my work, including the kind of workshops I offer for companies such as Saatchi and Saatchi. And you can also sign up to my monthly newsletter and receive a free download of the opening chapter of my book, Do Sing, Reclaim Your Voice and Find Your Singing Tribe, which includes a quote from Richard in there. Thanks again so much for listening to the podcast. And if you've enjoyed it, do share with your friends, rate and review and subscribe. It really helps get the word out there. And that is the ultimate aim of this podcast, is to help spread the good news about singing and hopefully to inspire people to get back to singing if they stopped, just like Richard. So please join me next time. Look out for the next episode. And until then, keep singing, keep smiling, and thank you.